Sarah. I'm the Events and Exhibitions Manager um, at the RCN Library and Archive. I'm going to leave uh, Crimson Tea Parties Presents uh, crew to tell you a bit more about that. Uh, we're really excited to have them back um, at uh, doing another event with RCN Libraries. Um, so I'll hand over to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, we're absolutely like overwhelmed with where you're all coming from. This is such a cool global audience, so thank you so much for tuning in. As Sarah mentioned, this is our second event with RCN Libraries, but our first digital one, so really excited to do this tonight. Um, so I'm Anna, part of Crimson Tea Parties, and we also have Susanna and Steph. Susanna and Steph are our resident fashion historian specialists, <laughs> so they will be doing tonight's talk. Um, and I will be popping back later to do the Q&A. A really important thing about tonight is that we're trying to raise um, funds for the Bloody Good Period COVID, donation, uh, COVID um, fund. So if you could make a donation tonight, I think the link will be shared in the chat. Um, it would be so appreciated so that we can support the women out there during this time. So I'm going to hand you over now to Susanna and Steph and I'll see you later. Thank you very much, Anna and Sarah. So in our talk today, we're going to be building on our expertise at Crimson Tea Parties. We like to tackle subjects that might otherwise turn you crimson or make you embarrassed. But in particular, we like looking at areas of women's history and cultural history that you might not otherwise hear about. Um, in particular, as Anna mentioned, our own expertise is in fashion history. And that often lends itself quite easily or strongly to telling women's stories, whether that's from a kind of employment and industrial perspective, whether it's in terms of self-image and self-presentation and how that means the world experiences you or you experience the world. Um, but it can also end up uh, relating to particular areas of employment. For instance, tonight we'll be talking about nursing and uniforms. Um, in the name of time, there's nothing like writing a talk to make you realize how big a subject it is. <laughs> so we've decided to narrow largely um, from the 1850s onwards, although Steph will take us a brief step uh, back in time before we get there. Um, think of it as a themed introduction rather than an encyclopedic guide to the subject. Um, so we're gonna look at things like giving you an overview of major developments in nursing uniforms in the UK. We'll focus on women's uh, nursing uniforms because of the themes we've already outlined, but we will touch on uh, male nursing uniforms as well. Um, we'll also within that address some myths and stereotypes about nurses and the ways that they've been portrayed in popular culture and how their uniform has maybe been co-opted or manipulated in those depictions. Um, and within that we'll also touch on or briefly explore the relationship between uh, fashion and nursing uniforms and how the two have kind of interwoven. Um, we will have a round within our quiz that's on nursing and or nursing uniforms and history that we'll uh, draw on, on the uh, talk tonight. So maybe note, so make some notes if you hear any good stats that you think might come up. I'll hand over to Steph now who's going to start our history. Yep, yeah, so uh, just briefly to give you a little introduction before 1850s, um, although largely undocumented, some forms of nursing have been practiced for thousands of years. Egyptians hired midwives to assist with childbirth, emperors' wives tended to be ill uh, in ancient Rome, and monks and nuns took care of the sick during times of war. Um, but really at the turn of the 17th century, a dark veil fell upon uh, this very early form of nursing. Monasteries to care for the ill were abolished during the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century uh, and replaced by workhouses and arms houses for the poor. So the places that um, uh, to nurse the sick were few and far between, and those that did exist were really abysmal abysmal conditions, uh, overwhelming poverty, filth and disease uh, really marred this very early age of nursing. Um, so really this period from 1600 to 1850 became known as the dark age of nursing. Um, and it was in the 1850s with the arrival of Florence Nightingale and her work during the Crimea War, uh, reforming treatment of the sick, that nursing education really changed forever. And this also marked the dawn of uh, nursing uniforms. So prior to Nightingale, nurses didn't really wear uniforms as they were not a formally organised profession. Um, they dressed just as any other 19th century middle class woman would for day wear, typically a, a long dress. Um, but for Nightingale's team uh, of 38 nurses based out of Scutari Hospital uh, near modern day Istanbul, they dressed um, in a uniform which you can see uh, in the middle here. Um, so it was a grey tweed dress, grey worsted jacket, white caps, short woolen cloaks um, and 
they also wore over the top of it a brown scarf embroidered in red with the word Scutari Hospital, which you can see on the third image here. Um, and this is regarded as the first official nurse's uniform. Now, Scutari uh, was a really disorderly camp full of drink shops, prostitutes and idle uh, troops. One Crimean veteran noted that he saw a nurse uh, seized by a soldier in the streets of, of Scutari, um, but his mate told him to leave her alone because he recognised the uniform and recognised that it was one of Miss Nightingale's women. Uh, so really, in many ways, this uniform uh, created a recognisable look and a practical attire for the nurses, um, which helped in Nightingale's quest to legitimise the nursing profession, but it also provided a really necessary protection for the women in the camp. Um, and I've also included on the right here this really uh, cute picture um, of a Florence Nightingale Barbie, which was launched this year by Mattel as part of their Inspiring Women series uh, to mark the centenary of Nightingale's bicentenary. And this doll wears a kind of key elements of the first ever uniform, the grey dress, the white cap, the scutari sash, and the iconic Turkish lamp, which Nightingale carried uh, while she was in Crimea. Uh, by 1860, Nightingale had established the first school for training nurses at St. Thomas's Hospital in London. And it was one of her first students, Miss Van Renson Leyer, uh, who's credited with designing the earliest uniforms. And Nightingale at the time insisted no crinolines, which is a very large hoop skirts, and no polonaise, which is a very tight bodice, voluminous skirts, which were popular in the 19th century. Uh, she didn't want any of those to be worn because she was really concerned it would hinder the movement of the nurses and disrupt the calm in the wards. Uh, the image on the left here that you can see is Nightingale towards the end of her life, around about 1910, uh, with her class of nurses uh, in their uniforms. So again, you can see it's a very long dress with white collar and cuffs, uh, a pinafore apron and a nurse's cap. And the image on the right that you see here um, are two designs for uniforms worn by the Queen Alexandra Imperial Military Nurses uh, in 1915. The red cape design, um, which was worn by uh, these nurses and became a kind of common feature of military nurses' uniforms, is inspired by the original woolen cloak worn by Nightingale Scutari nurses. Next slide. <laughs> So Steph spoke there about the way that one individual and their career and their kind of control or management of their particular locality and team led to developments in uh, nursing uniforms. The next area of kind of key development is around nursing education. So as nursing became a more essentially controlled career where you had to undertake certain kinds of schooling and training, so too did standards rise within the sector and also um, standardisation within uniforms. It can be quite tricky to trace these different uh, trends or developments because essentially at this point they're really localised. So school to school, college to college or hospital to hospital um, or perhaps charity trust they might set their own uniform standards within nursing. Um, between the late 19th century and the 1940s, this means that kind of minor changes occurred in the uniform in terms of the image overall. Um, but the uniform kind of continued to consist largely of a dress, pinafore, apron and nurse's cap. Um, particular developments within the way that uh, nursing nurses were trained and monitored, such as the Nurses Registration Act in 1919, um, really set some uh, kind of more clear standards around this, which Steph will tell you more about later on. Um, but as some examples of the ways in which those might be kind of localised, but might lead to some of the images that we're used to today, or we associate with nurses historically, for instance, um, the armband that has been, I think, appeared in some of our images already, um, that began with the Red Cross. It was identification for kind of the fact that this is um, a nursing staff. A lot of the time with early coding, such as some of the references within the Nightingale uniforms um, around nursing uniforms, it's about making it very clear who you need help from and what they're able to provide. And the armbands and also colour coding within uniforms was a clear way of doing that from the early 20th century. Um, and then this ended up being adopted by some other schools and services. Go okay, next slide. Um, so we'll go into more detail about some of those developments as we give you a bit more of a guide through the period. But at this point, I also thought it was worth mentioning that while it is a reflection of the growing respectability of the uh, profession and also different standardizations and forms of training, meaning that it's more closely monitored and also therefore that maybe a hospital um, is more clearly identifying their staff and uniform uh, is a clear way of doing that. There's also something going on with the development of nurses' uniforms 
that relates more directly to the wider world and particularly from our lens to fashion. So whilst the uniforms are developing in part because of their relationship to function, so um, as Steph mentioned, things like the practicality of the garment, although I read lots of um, personal accounts in preparation for this talk and it sounds like it's still problems today and um, lots of people with issues of yeah different particularities of their uniform but it was particularly the case that um in, in the past so in part it's about function it's about making it more streamlined more practical for the particular kind of wear or use it's also about making it more hygienic um easier to care for that could be with things like internal laundries within a hospital but alongside that need for additional and evolving function, there was also this reflection of fashion. So with the examples I've put on screen that take us from the 1910s through to the 1950s, I'll briefly touch on the ways in which these uniforms are related to the wider fashion trends um, of the period. Um, this allowed the uniforms to have a kind of sense of familiarity perhaps and related them to kind of feminine ideals or the way essentially you used to seeing a woman in a public sphere which perhaps is maybe about um kind of centering or climatizing the vision of a working woman in this particular context and um, so for instance in the 1910s um so the uniform would have as a standard have been a skirt and shirt uh, a skirt and shirt or blouse and um, this reflects fashions and forms of the time um, where it was quite common to have a dress or a skirt that you would then have um, changeable inserts or blouses so that you could get as many outfits out of one construction as possible and um, the skirt would be tapered um, and straight um, also high collars um, and detailing around the collar, collar were very fashionable at the time, which you can kind of see reflected in our example on the left. Um, in the 1910s, it's also very common for women to be wearing corsetry and many accounts of found of nurses uniforms at the time implied that you would still be wearing a laced corset underneath your uniform, which I don't know about you, but doesn't sound particularly convenient. <laughs> um, in the 1920s, uh, our image here shows a further reflection perhaps of fashion in that the skirt is starting to, to rise. Um, so it could be above the ankle, it could be mid-calf. Again, there's a reflection of the fashions of the period. They also tend to be less structured and looser fitting at the time, although in this particular instance, the uniform is being, um, sorry, the apron is being used essentially to cinch, but this in turn could be seen to um, reflect some of the silhouettes of the period of sack dresses and things that worked away from a woman's body rather than always following the line of uh, the, natu uh, the natural silhouette or the, um, you know, additional silhouette if you're using any corsetry or similar and um, we then have the 1940s which Steph will tell you more about um, in a future section but essentially we get a lot of military influence and association with other forms of uniform in the nursing uniform and um, that can mean things like exaggerated collars and um, very practical defined fastenings um, and really um, defined shoulders as well that does relate to uniform, but it also relates to fashion in London and in Paris at the time, and it's a clear trend of the period. In the 1950s, you then start to get things that are related to, again to fashion, um, but they start to be more idealised, I would argue. So it's a very um, feminine presentation of a nursing uniform in these particular examples, with their, uh, I would argue, short but still impractical puff sleeves, although very fashionable <laughs> at this current moment, and um, their neat pinned cap on the back, which again is to be honest, not really providing any hygienic function, it's decorative, and then nipped in waist. This in turn, uh, the silhouette of the clothes relates it to the new look by Dior, um, which came into fashion from, the from 1947. So again, we have something that has function, fit, relation, and clear identification with a profession, but it also relates you to more idealized or fashionable images of women and what you expect to see a woman wearing in a public space. Um, through a similar kind of time period of what we've loosely covered so far, as you get to kind of the late 19th to the early 20th century, you start to see an adoption of the image of the nurse in popular culture. We'll go into more detail about this later by looking at some kind of on-screen examples and things. Um, but just to kind of um, set that tone and see the way that it related to the wider kind of cultural experience, in particular the way that the uniform played into it at the time. We've got a couple of examples. Uh, first of all, Steph found these brilliant images of the little girls dressed as nurses, both of which are from 1890. Uh, she also found a description from um, 
Arden Holt's fancy dress described or what to wear to a fancy dress ball uh, from 1887, which I'd love a copy of. Um, <laughs> there was a real trend for fancy dress balls in the turn of the 20th century, which also um, became kind of ignited again in the 20s and 30s. Some of those were about kind of appropriating or reusing past forms of dress, but there was also a really clear code of um, buying into recognizable images. So the fact that at this point in the 1880s, the nurse is included as a recognizable image is really striking. So there are two descriptions within this text of what a nurse's costume might be. Uh, for instance, there's a nurse uh, as embroidered muslin cap with ribbons and round crown, striped gingham gown made with high bodice, striped stockings. So we already have the idea that this is clearly going to be a recognisable image or idea of the nurse. But from what we've learned so far, it sounds like an exaggeration. Um, it's not literal, it is costume, it is kind of not necessarily pastiche, but it's a reference point. And that will probably play into some of the things we talk about later about the way nurses are remembered or depicted. There's also Geneva sister at slash ambulance nurse, Red Cross nurse, sister of charity or mercy. So you're hedging your bets if you go for this costume. <laughs> you can wear black stuff dress, hardly touching the ground, high bodice, sleeves to wrist, linen collar and cuffs, muslin cap. At fancy dress balls, the dress is sometimes made of green merino, which seems quite a contrast to the black originally described. So again, it shows you as it does in the images. There's some clear kind of constructions and particular combinations of garment types that are at play here that the viewer um, or the fellow guest on these balls might expect to see you wearing if they're looking at you to consider whether you're dressed as a nurse. But within that, there's already games at play of variants that you might use within that uniform and ways you might exaggerate it for your own ends and means. So with the increased respectability of the nursing profession within society uh, and more familiarity with nurses' roles uh, and image, um, as Susanna has mentioned, uh, the depictions of nurses began to appear in all sorts of places, even as early as the 1890s, and particularly in advertising, uh, sometimes in quite unlikely places. So the image that you see on the left-hand side um, is an advert for alcohol, uh, <laughs> for Ale, Stout and Cooper from 1890. Um, and it lists a whole range of hospitals that use these drinks. Um, and there's a really interesting demonstration of gender roles here. So the advert centers on uh, a female nurse uh, serving or promoting the drink. And she's wearing a uniform very similar to Nightingale St. Thomas's nurses uh, from the late 19th century. But the text specifically says nothing about nurses. It says medical men recommend their products, which I find um, frustrating. Uh, and then the image on the right hand side uh, is uh, the image of a Red Cross nurse wearing dress apron and hair veil with the iconic Red Cross armband um, from 1906 and this was used to promote uh, Rizla cigarette rolling paper which <laughs> seems mad um, knowing what we do about the, the um, dangers of alcohol and uh, smoking within society today I'm pretty sure advertising standards would not <laughs> include uh, images of nurses in promoting these products. Um, and then with the, it was really with the advent of uh, World War One um, in 1914 that the importance of nursing became recognised so broadly within society. Uh, so during the war, over 100,000 women served at home and overseas as nurses working in military hospitals or closer to the battlefield. And there were three uniformed nursing organisations open to British women. Uh, the first um, was the First Aid Nursing Yeomanry, which you can see an image of the uniform on the left hand side here. So very, um, very military uniform, uh, but with the addition of a cross, red cross and a white um, badge on the arms. Uh, the second one was uh, Voluntary Aid Detachments or VAD. And you can see a poster second image on the left here. And also the lady in the third image on the right hand side um, is a, a bad uh, officer. Uh, and the lady on the left of the third image, she's from the Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nurses, who I mentioned earlier, who were officially attached to the British Army. And this is her uniform that she depicts here. Uh, the image on the right hand side, this is Edith Cavell. Uh, and this is a watercolor of her bottom right. Uh, she was a matron in the British Red Cross uh, who famously treated countless soldiers, regardless of their nationality, and helped as many as 200 Allied soldiers escape from German-occupied Belgium um, during the war. But in 1915, Edith was arrested for treason, um, and despite international pressure for mercy, she was sentenced to death and executed by a uh, German firing squad in 1915. 
And it was images like this of Edith in her Red Cross uniform and hair veil that were circulated around the world and got significant, significant sympathetic press coverage. Uh, news of Edith's murder uh, was used as propaganda to support the war effort. And in the weeks after Cavell died, the number of young men who were enlisting went up significantly. So again, it's this idea of um, the nurse's image being used to uh, pr pr promote the war effort and encourage more people to sign up. But the symbolic use of nurses' images uh, in times of war is not limited to British propaganda. It also appears in lots of nationalist propaganda in many countries, um, both as a way of recruiting nurses with much needed skills, uh, but also recognizing the vital role that nurses played as the cornerstone of the nation's war effort. Um, so you can see from left to right here, we've got a British uh, World War I recruitment po poster that says, are you in this? And it lists soldiers, civilians, a nurse and a boy scout who are working and fighting under a waving Union Jack. Uh, the second one here is a government propaganda poster um, about the hero heroic role of nurses during the Spanish Civil War. The third one is an American World War II recruitment poster. Your country needs you, uh, become a nurse. And on the right, we have a Chinese Cultural Revolution poster uh, with the tagline, prepare for an invasion from the sky. And you can see there is a nurse uh, alongside a soldier and a worker. So they're the kind of key pillars of the communist society. Um, head coverings. Uh, so head coverings have been a key part of nursing uniforms since the very first uniform uh, was created for the Scutari Hospital in, in 1855. Um, and during the early 20th century, many nurses often wore hats or hair coverings uh, vis to visually uh, very, very similar to the nurses' habits. You can see on the left here, the nurses' habit from 1910. Uh, and a nurse's hair veil from 1920, uh, visually very similar. And many of the sources that I looked at have linked the nun's habit as inspiration for the design, citing the fact that historically the role of nuns was uh, caring for people within the community. But in reality, I think it's actually probably more driven by hygiene and the idea of covering nurses' hair um, to protect against uh, pathogens and infections and diseases. Um, next slide, please. As the nursing profession developed further following the war, a whole industry of um, potential products to market to nurses also developed alongside it. Um, you can see the image on the left here uh, is an advert from the British Journal of Nursing, April 1924. Um, and it's one of many very um, comfortable footwear adverts which feature in lots of nursing journals in the early 20th century. This one is from a company called Bendable Shoes, uh, who are based in Oxford Street in London. Uh, and the caption reads, nurse, make your work lighter. Um, so it really underlines the importance of comfort and practicality, but it also reflects the broader fashion uh, for glacé kid ankle boots, Oxford shoes, and strapped Mary Jane shoes in the 1920s. Uh, the image on the right, is an advert from Nursing Times um, for state registered uniforms in 1928, um, which Susanna touched on earlier. Um, and it's a really lovely selection of uh, objects available uh, for sale. So um, a made to measure cloak on the left hand side here, uh, nurse's wristwatch, a storm cap, uh, a very stylish black silk coat on the right uh, with the very uh, kind of drop waist elongated silhouette, which is typical of the 20s and even bicycles, which were marketed as essential for visiting patients. Um, and as Susanna touched on, so it was really, uh, state registered uniforms were introduced with the Nurses Registration Act in 1919, which formalized uh, nurse training, uh, examination and registration. So from 1925 onwards, the only nurses who could register were those that had trained and passed exams at an approved school. And in order to obtain a uniform, the um, state registered nurse had to have a permit issued by the General Nursing Council, uh, which you can see bottom right here. Um, the image on the left uh, shows the state registered uniform in 1946, uh, which is um, very typical of the 1940s style, uh, kind of broad shouldered boxy cut jacket, typical of the 40s, um, complete with a very lovely brimmed hat. Uh, and you can see in the middle here, so this is an image of a lady called uh, Glenis Williams, who became a state registered nurse in 1967. And this is her um, unit, uniform permit um, acquired in 1967. Um, 
and she says she there's a really lovely blog where she talks about um how much she loved her uniform and the process of becoming a state registered nurse um and it's really strict the, the permit says that if you're going to wear any parts of the uniform you have to wear it complete so if you wear the state registered um dress you have to wear it with one of the four designs of state registered hat if you wear the state registered uh cape you overcoat you have to wear that as part of the full outfit however the wearing of the uniform was not compulsory for all nurses. So it didn't become standardized national uniform at all. You would think with the uh, dawn of the NHS in, in 1948 uh, that there became a kind of standardized national nurses uniform. But at this stage, hospitals still continued to pay for nurses uniforms and were free to use local suppliers or come up with their own designs. Um, you can see the image on the left here that I've included. This is uh, from February 1948, uh, the year that the NHS was established, and it's uniforms for um, the National Training Training School for Midwives in London. Their trainees calling a newborn baby, um, and you can see the uh, lady on the far left that has a little badge. Um, so we know that she must have graduated from the Nightingale Training School for nurses because she's wearing the Nightingale badge on her apron, the little cross. Um, so despite the fact that there wasn't at this stage a very standardized national uniform that was picked up by all hospitals, um, it was very individual. One style that did get a lot of traction was very popular from uh, after World War II um, and continued for many decades afterwards was the Newcastle style dress, which you can see an image of uh, three nurses wearing on the right hand side, um, which was a very fitted um, dress uh, available in a number of colors with an open Peter, Peter Pan collar uh, and a rear zip fastening. Um, so this was commonly used in lots of hospitals from the late 1940s until quite recently. Um, as we move to looking uh, at the 1960s and 1970s in a bit more detail, uh, one of the key things that you notice with the 1960s um, is shorter, narrow skirts, um, which obviously is reflected in the broader impact of the dawn of the miniskirt in the 1960s. Um, also increasingly shorter sleeves, again, Peter Pan collars, uh, and a much more simplified folded hat, which again, I don't think is really doing a huge amount in terms of hygiene, um, but looks very stylish. Um, the middle photograph that you see here uh, is a really lovely one from the RCN archives, um, which we should mention is an amazing resource. We've used a lot of their images uh, in this presentation. And yeah, it's a huge, huge wealth of research in there, which I would definitely recommend you to go and have a look at. Um, and this is of a, a lady called Nurse Bancroft. Um, she uh, was based at Leeds General Infirmary. And again, you can see the kind of Peter Pan collar, short sleeves, little um, white uh, hat. And then as we move into the 1970s, so the image on the right here is from uh, of a nurse called Nurse Olga Grant, um, who trained at Luton and Dunstable Hospital. Um, and by this stage, nurses, are, uh, nurses' dresses are either above the knee or just on the knee. Um, and the uh, big introduction within uh, nurses' uniforms, which again reflects broad fashion at the time, is the introduction of easy care synthetic fabrics. So uh, fabrics like terrilene, which come in, which make it far more easier to wash uniforms than had previously been the case. Uh, then as we move on to the 1980s, um, so plastic aprons tended to replace the more traditional fabric ones. Uh, again, we get much more open neck collars, as you can see uh, in this 1989 image on the left hand side here. Uh, and trousers, um, following more men kind of entering the nursing profession in the 1970s, trousers have become much more acceptable for women to wear as well as men. So you get lots more trousers and tunics becoming more widely available for both sexes. By the 1980s um, and I included this image on the right hand side because um, I think it's a really so this is basically an image from Trafford General uh, in Greater Manchester not far from where I was born and this was the first ever uh, hospital to offer free healthcare to all with the dawn of uh, the NHS in 1948 and to mark the uh, 70th anniversary of the uh, birth of the NHS they brought out a whole range of their costumes and did a photo opportunity. So going from left to right, these are uniforms from one um, hospital in the north of England from 1940 all the way to 2010. And as you see, as we're getting into the 1990s, the introduction of more kind of simple scrub-like uh, tunics and trousers. Um, yeah, I think that's all I want to say on that. 
convenient timing as within that slide Steph spoke about our gentlemen or the fact that male nursing was increasing at this point we really see that in the 60s and 70s and so we thought it'd be a point a useful point at which to check in we said we'd focus on women's uh, like female nursing uh, uniforms but there is also some interesting progress within male nursing uniforms through this period. I have to be honest, but it was it's harder to research. We found a lot less sources or kind of reference points or clarity around male nursing uniforms, which I think maybe says a disparity in status in itself. Um, most articles or kind of specialist readings that we did in advance would just to make the assumption that you were interested in uh, women's nursing uniforms. So, for instance, one uh, historical article that I read opened, if you ask a non-nurse friend to dress up as a nurse, what do you think she'd wear? Chances are she'd, wear, she'd reach for a white dress. So the assumption absolutely is, one, it'd be a woman dressing as it, and two, that our cultural image in our minds is a female nurse. Um, but male nursing actually has a really long history. Perhaps some of the issues around kind of identification, clarification or information um, about male nursing uniforms is that um, typically pre, I'm going to use Nightingale as my watershed, but pre-Nightingale male nursing is something um, that was, you know, it was a common and respectable profession to go into, but it was maybe contextualized or kind of termed differently. And it would also often be um, in line with or in association with another um, service, such as when Steph was talking about uh, the dark age of nursing, things like being part of a monastery or perhaps operating in a form of military service, you'd then have the function um, of essentially providing nursing support. But um, it's kind of framed differently so your entry into that profession as a man at that time would be through another means so then what you'd wear would maybe be set or reflected by that particular profession whether that's a monastery or whether it's for instance the navy um, as it, similarly the profession develops or the kind of acceptability of it but also the idea of unisex uniform grows you do see some um, reflections or developments um, but these two images I put as two kind of contrast points some of the main um, themes within those developments so on the right we see uh, a group of Royal Navy nurses from 1970 with two male team members the nurses are wearing, uh, the female nurses are wearing what we would probably recognize with from our own backgrounds and understanding, but also from the topics we've covered today as traditional female nursing uniforms. Whereas I think with the two gentlemen included, you might not initially recognize um, that context or role from that as they kind of more closely associated with the Navy and their form of dress. And um, the other main themes that we notice, particularly through the 20th century, are the kind of, again, the colour coding, the association with the role. Um, so rather than this being about the armband, the bib, etc., um, the, or the, the dress underneath being the colour code point, instead it seems relatively standard for a male nurse to wear a pair of trousers and a shirt, white trousers usually, and then either as our 1970s gentleman, the previous slide had a high coloured white um, shirt or as our gentleman here shows his um his female nurses his colleagues are all in blue dresses and he has a coordinated blue shirt so it's more an association with a core uh, core standard of um uniform rather than a uh, kind of uniform developing its own right and that obviously starts to change kind of 70s onwards as you start to get those more unisex forms um coming through so looking at the idea of NHS nursing uniforms today, uh, factors in play include basically the evolutions of things we've already discussed, for instance, whether something's fit for purpose, hygiene, practicality. Um, it's less common for a hospital to have its own internal laundry structure. So it's kind of more common for health professionals to have to bring their own um, items home. Uh, those coded distinctions of the roles have only increased um, so as an example, on the left, I've included this who's who guide uh, from Bolton Hospital. So it's an A to Z of all the different health professionals that you might meet with um, during your visit to Bolton Hospital. Um, and I think it's quite striking that the way that they identify them very clearly um, is the colour code, essentially. Everyone will be wearing scrubs, but there'll be variants within that that relate to the particular function of their role, but also just allow you at 50 paces to, to recognise the right person. Although, to be honest, don't quiz me on uh, what those individual colour codes are. I think it must take a long time to learn the individual ones. So yes, we've got 54 different colours of scrubs denoting those different um, roles, expertise and rank. 
Um, there was a lot of discussion recently around the distinction of PPE and mm -hmm. almost what members of the public should wear as protective wear versus what's required um, for members um, of the kind of health healthcare cohort. Um, so this quote comes from a Vogue article that was actually kind of tackling that topic. Um, um, in April, every time a patient coughs or sneezes on a cotton isolation gown, it will soak straight through, says British PPE manufacturer Richard Lamb. There must be a water or fluid repellent layer. Um, similarly, cotton thread cannot be used, especially when combined with polyester. I thought that was interesting itself, the idea of one um, material not necessarily overriding the other. Um, and he goes on to give some kind of specifications or identifications. I'll explain why he was doing that in my uh, couple of slides time. Um, in the meantime, my image on the right is um, an example of the fact I thought it's so clear and prominent with all, in all the kind of publicity and um, literal signposting and messaging around nursing and healthcare today, that scrubs are the norm and that within that you'll have different variants or distinctions that are used to kind of, yeah, as we said, color code or clarify who someone is and how they can help you or how they might be a part of your experience and treatment. Uh, despite that, you may well have read about in uh, the London Marathon in 2019, when Jessica Anderson um, wanted to break the world record for the quickest marathon run by a woman dressed as a nurse. Um, and the Guinness Book of Records initially declined her claim because they said that she would have essentially that scrubs are closer to what's defined as a doctor's outfit um, and weren't recognised as a nurse's uniform and that a nurse's uniform would have to involve a skirt or a dress. Um, this did end up being kind of retracted and addressed, but it's it's kind of interesting that that cultural distinction was already there and just, you know, for, I know that there's probably a distinction in terms of the running experience and either, and that's worth keeping in context, but the uh, Guinness Book of Records were already in the wrong with setting that standard. The London Marathon started in 1981. By that point, it's pretty standard for a nurse to be wearing trousers. Um, so any kind of uh, definition or assumption that a nurse would be female and wearing a dress is already, again, pulling on those cultural ideas of what a nurse looks like rather than the reality and playing into different stereotypes. So please that that was corrected. Um, while we've got those stereotypes and different kind of signaling systems that the uniforms used for or imagined as in our culture, we thought we'd touch on some different examples briefly, mindful of time and getting us to the quiz. So this might be a bit of a whiz through. Um, so yeah, particular one, uh, which I came across a lot and I'm sure you all have is um, the kind of virgin whore dichotomy when it comes to depicting nurses. Um, nurses as saviors, nurses as angels, saints, maternal figures, self-sacrificing heroes and heroines, uh, which all continues very, uh, this reinforcement of very regressive, oversimplified notions that nurses are noble and selfless and gentle saints rather than skilled professionals of all genders who use their experience and years of medical training to save lives. Uh, so just some of the images I've created in here, uh, Nurse's Maternal Figure and The Greatest Mother in the World, poster hmm. created for the 1941 War Fund. Uh, the middle one, Nurse's Angelic Saviour, uh, We Need You Red Cross Recruitment poster, uh, and on the right, Self-Sacrificing Heroine in the Comforter Red Cross World War I era poster uh, with an injured soldier. So something else within that uh, dichotomy that Steph's already outlined that you might have been anticipating <laughs> and I've already essentially rolled my eyes at already. And if any of you are in the nursing professional, which, uh, profession, which several of my friends are, I'm sad to say you've probably experienced in this in your working lives because it's um, sadly alive and well. But there is a very sexualized stereotype um, around the nursing profession and female nurses in particular, although I will look at that a bit more widely in a moment. Um, this stereotype does play largely on the uniform and friends who do work in depression today have said that um, patients have not been afraid to express their disappointment that the person treating them is not dressed the way that they imagined. And this is a long standing stereotype that appears in different kind of um, art renditions, but an easy early example could be the Betty Boot um, cartoon from the 1930s, but it also appears in carry on films um, and it seems to be pr particularly prolific as an image in the 60s and 70s in um, film and TV. 
it kind of carries through into other parts or portions of our uh, culture. So for instance, um, uh, Janine in the bottom left with the gloved blue hand, um, she appeared in the video and cover image for Blink-182's uh, song and album, What's My Age Again? Um, I remember fondly from my teenage years and now question entirely for that association um, the night nurse advertisement um, I googled this to check the date of it just before we came on um, but actually was waylaid by the fact that if you put that term in 29,800,000 results come up and I found over 30 different contemporary brands offering t-shirts with the slogan on that were very explicit in terms of what that might entail so sadly that image has run and continues to be popular and commercially viable and um, similarly rapper Cardi B uh, or comparably anyway rapper Cardi B here she is in Halloween costume in 2019 um, and I'll talk more about um, nurses uniforms as costume in uh, a moment so I did mention there that I that the image or the sexualization of nurses isn't uh, kind of specific to one sex. Um, it does also happen to male nurses. Um, there's a lot of debate or kind of um, right, rightful kind of trying to rewriting or trying to make um, male nursing a more aspirational career or option for young men. So you get things like the uh, um, archive McPhee figurine or doll on the right hand side encouraging you to become a male nurse but then sadly kind of countering that you get a lot of um, imagery and costume again that's related to the idea of the male nurse as a kind of role play opportunity and um, I think it's interesting how abstracted the male nurse um, uniform becomes in these images uh, it's got so little relationship <laughs> to the actual role <laughs> um, and actually to what, what they actually wear which again it shows the way that these things get manipulated they get exaggerated and they become a kind of projection point um, but it's interesting and sad that this continues to happen with this I'm probably going to dwell on this some more <laughs> go on so the idea of the male nurse's pinup I think this could be um a misdemeanor or kind of spin-off of uh, trying to promote what a fantastic career this could be for a young man and how important it is to have people of different genders and different orientations in the in the uh, in the sector and in the role and um, so who knew I was going to put a picture of Lee Mead in a powerpoint this is a career <laughs> first for me but here he is people like the internet assures me Lofty Chilton in Holby City it's held up as a pin-up um, within the idea or image of the male nurse. Um, this is the bit where my Google search history gets really dodgy. Um, <laughs> this is an interesting part of my role, particularly as I often work with kind of contemporary topics. So I tend to end up looking at some oddities. I like um, seeing what the realities are or how um, a contemporary fashion product might be experienced. So that's all my way laid excuses for the fact that I Googled sexy male nurse. I was really interested by the fact that particular influencers, so social media stars in this area came up. So there are particular male nurse, nurses working in the NHS who also effectively have a double career of preventing, presenting um, attractive or relatively risque images of themselves on Instagram and Snapchat. But then the other thing that came up very clearly um, was the image of the male nurse as a kind of stripper fantasy. So it tends to be a particularly popular um, stripper subject or character, which is interesting. Again, it's taking it completely out of context um, and exaggerating the form. So while we're here and we're holding up hands to embarrassing Googles, I thought <laughs> I'm going to have to do this um, more widely as well. So I Googled sexy nurse. Um, like absolutely inexhaustibly no results if you put that generalized non-gender specific term uh, come up that are related to men or any other genders it's very explicitly the assumption is that you want a latex or pvc suit so again it's taking this uh, uniform and turning it uh, othering it and taking it to this more kind of caricatured point and um, you also get over 384 million hits or options for it um, so this is definitely a popular topic. Um, as an example of the ways in which like, it's a difficult part of the conversational topic, but it's clearly um, very prominent as a stereotype or ideal. During the first, the Financial Times reported in April that during the first month of lockdown, sales of sexy nurse outfits um, went up 30 fold. So there's something in it. 
Uh, and then on the right, we have our final Google, dodgy Google search, I promise, <laughs> uh, sexy female nurse. And this was interesting because this brought up um, a mixture of those really extreme caricatured um, kind of sexualized renditions. And then the equivalence of the male nurses I discussed where there's a kind of influence of capacity and it's women posing in their scrubs within an actual kind of um, hospital or health practice context. Um, I think in either case, it's quite complicated um, to have scrubs presented in this context because it's one thing, although I would argue it's still very problematic and impacts on the vision for experienced people in the sector today, but it's one thing having this othered extreme version of the uniform that never really existed. It's another to have people actually um, operating in that area and have scrubs and the kind of practicality of that uniform played in a different way. So looking at 20th century fashion, um, designers have long had a love affair um, when it comes to nursing uh, and incorporating that within their designs. Um, <clears throat> but I found it interesting, which I didn't know before doing this research, that um, two of the biggest uh, 20th century designers, um, Pierre Cardin on the mm -hmm. left and middle and uh, Christian Dior on the right, all designed uh, nurses' uniforms, British nurses' uniforms. Mm -hmm. So the ones that you see on the left are from uh, October 1970. Um, and what you, they're from Pierre Cardin, what you don't get a sense of is um, the really playful colours, because it's obviously black and white, mm. um, typical photography at the time. Um, but the image, if you're looking at the, the middle image, the garment on the left hand side is a full length pink uniform, I'm presuming baby pink, um, with a white skull cap, crescent shaped front pocket. The middle outfit is a lemon yellow uniform with matching tie belt and circular cap. And the uniform on the right hand side is a white bolero and mini skirt over a pastel green body stocking, <laughs> which uh, apparently should have been used in the operating theatre. <laughs> and then the images that you see on the right hand side, these were produced by John Langberg uh, for Christian Dior um, in 1971. And again, British um, nursing uniforms. Uh, so from the left, we've got um, drill collots, which mm. is a really nice to kind of see bifurcated legs rather than traditional skirt, uh, frilled dress and cape, and also collots on the right with side slit. Um, and this kind of love affair that fashion has with nursing um, hasn't really gone away. Um, in some collections, like the one you see on the left here, um, Marc Jacobs for Louis Vuitton, it's a very kind of fetishized version of uh, the nursing uniform, which Susanna has talked a lot about. Um, and on the right hand side, this is a collection from earlier this year, spring, summer 2020. Uh, by John Galliano from Maison Margiela, which I found really interesting. I assumed that he'd been inspired by mm. the pandemic, yeah. but designers work way ahead of their schedules. So he'd already created these outfits and clearly just was ahead of the trend. Um, <laughs> yeah, he, he produced these way before the pandemic hit. But it's also interesting, uh, he said um, he dedicated this to the public spirit and, and heroic values of men and women in the Second World War, particularly featuring nurses' uniforms and military nurses' uniforms. Um, but I find it particularly interesting that um, there's lots of contemporary designers today who are referencing um, during this pandemic, their collections are explicitly based on nursing uniforms and military nursing uniforms. Um, so it's kind of entered their consciousness. So Steph spoke there about some of the ways in which contemporary and recent designers have referenced um, what kind of idealized or historic and um, yeah, I passed renditions of nursing uniforms. I was interested to look for some examples that I perhaps drew explicitly on scrubs or on that kind of contemporary depiction um, of nursing uniforms. So as an example, um, brand like kind of high-end and couture brands such as Prada and Giorgio Armani have referenced scrubs, but they've pulled more on the kind of colour coding, the block colour, um, the kind of abstracted tailoring, the structure with comfort effect rather than it being completely explicit. Uh, meanwhile, I spotted the um, jumpsuit on the left on Instagram and was really drawn in by it. Um, so this is by a brand called Peachy Den who specialise in jumpsuits, my thing. Um, and all, while nowhere says anything about the influence of scrubs, I couldn't help but notice. Um, they offer the same design in multiple colourways. So this same navy kernel jumpsuit is also available with, it's available with either white tipping which reminded me of the detailing on the collars and pockets um, 
of contemporary uh, scrubs, uh, but it's also available with red or with purple and, um, and different variants. So you could buy it and be associated with one brand of nurse. You could buy it and uh, be associated or referencing a senior sister, or you could be wearing uh, something that references a midwife, depending on the uniform color code you end up connecting with. Again, with a lot of these things, it might be that it's subconscious or it might be that it's explicit, but it shows the way in which this has kind of got into our, um, our cultural imagery. So as a kind of concluding point, we also wanted to briefly touch on the way in which fashion and nursing uniforms have explicitly interlinked within this current lockdown period, well, within this um, pandemic crisis period, um, and they continue to today. This has happened internationally in terms of the fashion industry responding, but we'll focus for now in terms of um, the UK. So for instance, the Scrub Hub has been founded, which could be anything from individuals working from their kitchen table to kind of makers and manufacturers working from their studios and um, producing scrubs um, for local hospitals and having a coordinated effort. There's also the Emergency Designer Network, which was founded in April 2020 um, by London-based designers Phoebe English, Holly Fulton and Bethany Williams. Um, again, they're working with their own expertise, but also with their own networks. So it could be individual seamstresses or it could be um, small runs in factories, places like um, the Black Horse Lane Ateliers um, near Walthamstow, which is an amazing initiative and group. Um, within, uh, I think, between um, April and September, they produced over 10,000 sets of scrubs and 50,000 surgical gowns. So a network like this can really, really contribute and respond to the circumstances that we're in and put fashion's relationship to nursing at the fore and um, produce something explicit and positive from that wider network and influence. So, we, that was quite a wide ranging <laughs> <laughs> um, and hopefully encompassing um, guide or introduction to some of the areas that we've covered. Um, we've looked at the, some of the main ways in which nursing uniforms have developed and the ways in which that reflects the evolution of the role. Um, and we've also linked it to wider fashion um, and the developments of the industry. Thank you so much, both of you. I feel like I've learned so much. Um, Obviously, I am not the um, fashion experts that these two are, so I've been learning along with you guys.